This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 51, for broadcast on the 27th of May, 2020. Coming up on Space Time, the Australian government orders a new orbital rocket, NASA's W-First Dark Energy Telescope to be renamed after Nancy Grace Roman, and how to build habitats on the moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The Australian Department of Defence, Science and Technology has awarded Queensland-based company Gilmore Space a contract to develop a new orbital rocket launch system. The project includes propulsion systems, materials and avionics technologies for a new three-stage rocket using Gilmore's hybrid rocket engine to launch small scientific payloads and satellites into low Earth orbit. As well as servicing the Defence Department and scientific institutions, the new launch system will also provide a low-cost alternative for commercial customers. OK, so why a hybrid rocket engine, especially as the majority of orbital-class rockets these days use either solid or liquid-fueled engines? Solid-fuel rocket engines provide huge amounts of thrust compared to their liquid-fueled counterparts. However, they lack controllability, meaning once ignited, they'll continue firing until they're empty. On the other hand, conventional liquid-fueled rocket motors provide excellent throttle control, allowing engines to be turned on and off as needed and allowing you to adjust the amount of thrust produced. However, liquid-fueled engines don't develop as much power as solids. They require complex turbine systems to produce sufficient combustion chamber pressure, and they need complex cryogenic propellant production and storage facilities. Gilmore's hybrid rocket engine design combines a liquid oxidizer with a propellant using solid-fuel 3D-printed pellets which can be fed to the rocket motor at a controlled rate, thereby allowing a degree of throttle control while still maintaining the high energy mass ratio of a solid rocket motor. The company began testing hybrid rocket engines in 2015 using both nitrous oxide and hydrogen peroxide with high-density polyethylene and high-density polyethylene wax blends. Gilmore's deal with Australia's Defence Department follows an agreement between the company and NASA in 2018 to collaborate on various space research and technology development initiatives and an agreement in December 2019 with ASA, the Australian Space Agency. Gilmore launched its first prototype Rasta hybrid sounding rocket in 2016, and it's hoping to launch its new Ares 103 stage hybrid rocket carrying a 100 kilogram test payload into low Earth orbit within the next year. That would then be followed in 2022 by the maiden flight of the larger Ares 400, a clustered engine launch vehicle design capable of carrying payloads of up to 400 kilograms. This is space time. Still to come. NASA formally names its W-First Dark Energy Telescope after Nancy Grace Roman, and the European Space Agency develops a new method of building habitats on the Moon. All that and more, still to come, on Space Time. NASA has formally named its new Dark Energy Space Telescope, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, WFIRST, in honour of the agency's first chief astronomer, Nancy Grace Roman, who paved the way for space telescopes like Hubble to observe the universe from orbit above all the effects of Earth's atmosphere. The newly named Roman Space Telescope is set for launch in the mid-2020s. It'll investigate long-standing astronomical mysteries such as dark energy, a mysterious force behind the universe's accelerating expansion, and it will search for distant planets beyond our solar system. Considered the mother of NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, which launched 30 years ago, opening a new window in the cosmos, Nancy Grace Roman tirelessly advocated for new tools that would allow scientists to study the broader universe from space. She left behind a tremendous legacy for the scientific community when she passed away in 2018. Despite 30 years of separation, NASA's Hubble and Roman Space Telescopes are actually siblings, part of a group of at least 22 basically identical telescopes built by Lockheed. But while NASA's Hubble was designed to look outwards into space, the remainder of this class were built for the National Reconnaissance Office, America's intelligence agency for space-based surveillance and they were designed to look down onto the Earth's surface. 
These telescopes have gone by a variety of official titles and code names, such as KH-11, Kennan, Crystal, Evolved Enhanced Crystal, 1010, Gambit and Hexagon, but are generally best known as Keyhole Spy Satellites. The first Keyhole satellites entered service in 1976, and over the years there have been at least six basic technology upgrades known as blocks, with at least two of the satellites called MISTI designed to be stealthy and virtually invisible to radar. The last Keyhole satellite was launched in January last year. But back in 2012, the National Reconnaissance Office donated a pair of Block 3 Keyhole spy satellites complete with spare parts to NASA, potentially for use as Hubble Space Telescope replacements. This pair were manufactured in the late 1990s and early 2000s and were originally meant to join the constellation of similar surveillance satellites orbiting the Earth but were never used because their technology became superseded by newer Block 4 and Block 5 versions. Now, because they're the same design as Hubble, they're the same size, roughly that of a school bus. And like Hubble, they're equipped with a 2.4 metre main mirror and designed to orbit at a similar altitude, roughly 550 to 560 kilometres above the Earth's surface. But because they were looking down at the Earth rather than up into space, they were using different equipment, and they have a shorter focal length, giving them a wider field of view, around 100 times larger than Hubble's Wide Field Camera 3 instrument. The two telescopes represent a multi-billion dollar gift from the National Reconnaissance Office to NASA. They come complete with spacecraft bodies, optical equipment, payload radiators and 1.5 metre long struts at the bottom for spacecraft instruments, but are still needing detectors, star trackers, prism wheels and filters. A couple of years ago, NASA decided to use one of these two Hubble replacements for a new space telescope specifically designed to find out about dark energy, this mysterious force which makes up three quarters of the universe's entire energy mass budget, but about which science knows absolutely nothing. The telescope will also use new technology to search for exoplanets, that is, planets orbiting stars other than the Sun. When it opens its eyes in the mid-2020s, it'll peer at the universe through some of the most sophisticated technology ever designed, the multi-layered chronograph instrument, a system of masks, prisms, detectors and self-flexing mirrors designed to block out the glare of distant stars and capture the light and even some spectra directly from exoplanets orbiting around those stars, as well as disks of dust and gas surrounding stars, which are the birthplace for newly forming planets. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope in orbit since 1990 is so far the only NASA astrophysics flagship mission to include chronographs, far simpler and less sophisticated versions of what will eventually fly aboard the Roman Space Telescope. NASA's other big space telescope mission at the moment, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is slated to launch next year, is also fitted with a chronograph. This one, with a sharpness of vision greater than that available on Hubble, but without the starlight suppression capability of Roman. Key to the chronograph are its two flexible mirrors. As light that's travelled for light years from an exoplanet enters the telescope, thousands of actuators move like pistons, changing the shape of the mirrors in real time. The flexing of these deformable mirrors compensates for tiny flaws and changes in the telescope's optics. In fact, changes on the mirror's surface are so precise, they can compensate for errors smaller than the width of a strand of DNA. These mirrors, in tandem with high-tech masks, another major advance, squelch the star's diffraction, that is, the bending of light waves around the edges of light-blocking elements inside the chronograph. The result, blinding starlight, is sharply dimmed, and voila, faintly glowing and previously hidden planets suddenly appear. The star-dimming technology could also deliver the clearest ever images of distant star systems during their formative years, when they're still embedded in disks of gas and dust as infant planets take shape inside. The debris disks we see today around other stars are brighter and more massive than what we have in our own solar system. And Roman's chronograph instrument could study fainter, more diffuse disk material, something more akin to what we find in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and the Kuiper belt and other dust disks orbiting beyond Neptune. And that could yield new insights into how our own solar system was formed. This report from NASA TV. A chronograph is a way to see distant planets hidden by the glare of the star they orbit. The chronograph reduces the light coming directly from the star to separate it from the light reflected by the planet. WFIRST doesn't block the star's light with an opaque disk as a simple chronograph might. Instead, it uses a combination of disks with complex patterns and light blocking stops to create destructive interference with the star's light, effectively making it disappear while allowing the light from planets to pass through. 
A complicating factor is that the light picks up small distortions as it reflects off the telescope's series of mirrors, and these distortions can reduce the effectiveness of the destructive interference. Collecting more light increases the image signal, but the planets are still hidden under blobs of leftover, distorted starlight. To remove these blobs, the coronagraph has special deformable mirrors that can change shape by using hundreds of tiny pistons. This corrects the distortions in the light beam. As the mirrors deform, the blobs of light slowly begin to disappear, revealing brighter planets. Further adjustment brings fainter planets into view. Advanced software processes this data, further improving the contrast and clarity of the image. This processing makes objects more than a billion times fainter than the star visible. As a result, WFIRST will provide the first look at individual planets in star systems that might be similar to our own. The Roman Space Telescope's other primary focus will be on studying the mysterious force known as dark energy. The universe has been expanding outwards ever since its creation in the Big Bang some 13.82 billion years ago. Scientists hypothesize that the force of gravity from all the mass in the universe should be slowing the universe's rate of expansion down. Eventually, depending on the amount of mass in the universe, that expansion would ultimately stop, leaving the universe in a steady state of perfect balance. But alternatively, if there was enough mass in the cosmos, then gravity could become the dominating force, causing everything in the universe to slowly begin to contract again, eventually accelerating faster and faster until ultimately crashing together in what scientists describe as the Big Crunch. And that could be followed by another Big Bang explosion, then another Big Crunch and another Big Bang and so on. However, during the 1990s, astronomers were studying thermonuclear type 1a supernova events. The stars which create these supernovae all explode at about the same mass. Consequently, they all explode with the same degree of power and hence luminosity. And by using the inverse square law, astronomers can determine how far away these supernovae are. It's like looking at a row of streetlights down the road. The ones further away will appear dimmer than the ones closer to you, even though you know that they all have exactly the same intrinsic brightness. And so you can use them as standard candles to determine cosmic distances. Unexpectedly, astronomers found that more than 50 of these supernovae were fainter than they should have been for their measured redshift. Redshift is a measure of how far space-time the fabric of the universe has expanded based on the position of spectroscopic emission lines. The observations of these distant supernovae suggested that instead of slowing down as predicted, the rate of the universe's expansion was actually accelerating. Some unknown force, which astronomers are calling dark energy, dark because they have no idea what it is, is causing space-time to expand at an ever-accelerating rate. The idea of a dark energy force isn't new. It was first invented by Albert Einstein back in 1917. You see, like most scientists of his day, Einstein assumed that the universe was stable and everything in it was in balance, just as it should be. The trouble was his own equations showed that in such a universe, gravity would be the dominating force crushing everything together. Einstein felt he was missing something, but he couldn't work out what it was. So he fudged it. He invented an expansion force for the energy density of space, a vacuum energy, if you will, something to counter gravity in his field equations in the process creating what he called a cosmological constant to return the universe to a steady state. However, Einstein was forced to abandon this concept in 1931 after astronomer Edwin Hubble, the dude they named the telescope after, discovered that everything in the universe really was expanding away from everything else. Einstein is reputed to have later described his cosmological constant as his biggest blunder. However, the recent discovery that space-time really is expanding at an ever-accelerating rate has once again resurrected the cosmological constant. Einstein was right again. Dark energy means that ultimately the universe is heading for a big freeze. All the galaxies will eventually expand away from each other, until ultimately only our local galactic group would remain together, in what would be a very cold, black and empty universe. A more extreme version of dark energy, known as phantom energy, would see the forces of dark energy increase so much that it would ultimately lead to what scientists are calling a big rip. A big rip would see the expansion of space-time occur not just on the cosmic scale of relativity theory, 
but also at the subatomic level, ripping atoms apart into the constituent protons, neutrons and electrons, and even overcoming gluons to rip off quarks. Roman will study the expansion history of the cosmos, providing observations to help astronomers understand exactly what dark energy really is. It'll survey the growth history of the universe's large-scale structure, in order to test possible explanations for its apparent accelerating expansion, including dark energy and modifications to Einstein's gravity. It'll undertake a dedicated high-latitude survey which will provide four bands of imaging and spectroscopy over around 2,000 square degrees. Using these data, Roman can measure the expansion history of the universe and the growth of large-scale cosmic structures such as galaxy clusters together with their associated halos of dark matter. It'll use the peak brightness of Type 1a supernovae as standard candles to measure the expansion of the universe even more accurately. It'll also study weak gravitational lensing events to determine the expansion history and the growth of structures simultaneously by measuring the distribution of dark matter structures through their effect on the light from distant galaxies. And it will study baryonic acoustic oscillations, a sort of imprint of primordial sound waves from the Big Bang on the clustering of galaxies, which can be used as standard rulers to measure cosmic expansion. This report from NASA TV. The Universe. For all we have learned about it, we have only just begun to reveal its secrets. What are dark matter and dark energy? How common are planetary arrangements like our own? And how many planets in our galaxy have the potential to harbor life? The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will help answer these fundamental questions. Formerly known as WFIRST, the Roman Space Telescope is similar to Hubble, but with the benefit of 30 years of technological improvement. Each image from its wide field instrument will have the depth and clarity of Hubble's best, but capture a sky area 100 times larger. The Roman Space Telescope will take the lead in exploring dark energy and dark matter. We only know they exist by their effects on observable matter, yet these two mysterious components make up 95% of the universe. The Roman Space Telescope's powerful 2.4 meter mirror and enormous field of view will also help us in the search for planets beyond our solar system, or exoplanets. It will watch for gravitational microlensing events caused when a planet and its host star pass in front of a background star. Such events are rare, so catching them requires watching large swaths of the sky. To deepen its study of exoplanets, the Roman Space Telescope will house a beyond state-of-the-art coronagraph that will directly image and analyze Neptune-sized planets in orbits slightly larger than Earth's a dramatic improvement over current capabilities. The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will help us answer many of the biggest cosmic questions. Its wide field view and coronagraph will complement missions like NASA's James Webb Space Telescope and transiting exoplanet survey satellite, TESS. The Roman Space Telescope will be an indispensable part of space science during the next decade and beyond. The European Space Agency has developed a new use for urine as a super plasticizer for making a robust type of concrete on the moon for the construction of habitats. Scientists are looking at different ways to build radiation-shielded habitats on the lunar surface without needing to transport all the materials from Earth. They've already developed a geopolymer compound made out of regolith, the fine powdery soil found everywhere on the lunar surface, which would act as a type of concrete. Scientists found adding urea, the main organic compound found in urine, worked better than common plasticizers such as naphthalene and polycarboxylate to reduce the need for water. Urea improved the mixture, making it more malleable for molding before hardening into its final shape. Tests show the resultant product can support 10 times its own mass while withstanding harsh space conditions such as vacuum and extreme temperatures, ranging from 114 degrees Celsius down to minus 80. This is space time. Still to come, the science report and autopsies of patients who died from COVID-19 show the virus is present in multiple organs, and a new study showing that global warming has made cyclones and hurricanes stronger and more intense. All that and more still to come 
on Space Time. And time there to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Autopsy is carried out on 22 patients in Germany who died of COVID-19 have revealed that the virus was present in multiple organs. A report in the New England Journal of Medicine says that in addition to the lungs and respiratory tract, smaller amounts of viral RNA were detected in kidneys, in the liver, in the heart, brain and blood. The presence of the virus in these organs affects the course of the disease and could put people with existing disease in these organs at greater risk. Researchers also found that in three out of six deceased patients, the virus was also found in several places in the kidney, which may explain reports of kidney damage in some COVID-19 patients. A new study, also reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, has shown how domestic cats inoculated with SARS-CoV-2 have demonstrated the virus can be passed on to other cats when housed together. Now, none of the cats showed any symptoms of COVID-19, but they did generate antibodies against the virus. Previous research had already shown human-to-cat transmission of the virus, as well as transmission between domestic cats, tigers and lions. But this was the first study performed under controlled laboratory conditions. Meanwhile, a separate study in the journal Nature claims that the first two family dogs reported to have coronavirus did most likely catch the infection from their owners. However, researchers say it's still unclear whether the infected dogs can transmit the virus to other animals or back to humans. Scientists found that the genetic sequences of the viruses from the two dogs, a Pomeranian and a German Shepherd, were identical to the virus detected in their respective human owners. Long-term data shows global warming is making cyclones and hurricanes stronger and more intense. The findings are based on a study led by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which analysed nearly 40 years of hurricane satellite imagery. The research reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences confirms earlier climate change modelling on the likely effects of global warming on hurricanes and cyclones. The findings build on previous 2013 work, which identified trends in hurricane intensification across a 28-year data set. The new findings have extended this research to include global hurricane data from 1979 to 2017 using additional analytical techniques, including infrared temperature measurements from geostationary satellites to estimate hurricane intensity. This allowed the authors to identify poleward migration of hurricanes, where tropical cyclones are travelling further north or south, exposing previously less affected coastal populations to greater risk. It also found that hurricanes are moving more slowly across land due to changes in Earth's climate. That's resulting in greater flooding risks and storm damage as the cyclones are hovering over cities for more extended periods of time. Scientists have developed a new prototype quantum radar device. A report in the journal Science Advances claims the new technology, developed by physicists at the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria, utilises quantum entanglement to detect objects. The authors say this successful integration of quantum mechanics into everyday devices could significantly impact biomedical and security industries. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audioboom, Podbeam, Android, CastBox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Space Time online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter 
at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 